Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, for being patient with us um, while we get things together um, for this great session today. Uh, we're first going to start off with a little bit of introduction about OBC, and uh, um, and then we'll get into our speakers in just one moment. Hello, I am Steve Hounsel, Chair of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. I'd like to welcome all of you to our Ontario Biodiversity Summit, Nature-Based Solutions for the 21st Century. I also want to briefly introduce you to the Ontario Biodiversity Council, now in its 16th year and the host of this summit. We are a provincial level organization that has come together to achieve the vision and higher order goals and targets that have been set by Ontario's biodiversity strategy a 10-year strategy that aligns with the Global Strategic Plan for Biological Diversity and its associated IACHI targets. That strategy is a blueprint championed by Council for an ecologically sustainable future for Ontario, its biodiversity and its people, something we believe is well worth pursuing. We occupy a unique space that links global biodiversity targets with both national efforts and more local implementation efforts. We are working to mainstream biodiversity across all sectors and at all scales in an effort to protect what sustains us. It is embodied in the very membership of council with some 38 organizations from a broad constituency of industry and industry associations, conservation and environmental groups, natural heritage institutions, academia, indigenous organizations, and the provincial government, all united around the theme of protecting what sustains us our biodiversity. So again, I welcome you to our virtual summit. We hope that the summit will connect people from across Ontario, Canada, and around the world to talk about, celebrate, and most importantly, take action to protect biodiversity. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, it's Colin Casson with the Invasive Species Center here. Just want to apologize. We're having a bit of a technical hiccup, so uh, thanks for hanging in there with us. I see 42 attendees on the line, so glad you were able to find us. Uh, just want to let you know we're here. Uh, we're just sorting through a, a hiccup or two. So if you could take a second there, just to refresh your copy. Uh, we'll be back online in just a second and get the show moving. Uh, appreciate your patience here. We're all working through this as fast as we can. So I'll hold tight. The next voice you're going to hear is the chair of the Ontario Biodiversity Council, uh, Steve Hounsel and Dorothy Taylor giving a bit of a context setting for today's session and all of our sessions uh, about what we're coming together here to discuss biodiversity and agriculture. So appreciate your patience, hang tight. We're, we're almost sorted through all of this and uh, look forward to today's webinar. So uh, hold tight and uh, we'll be with you in a sec. Hello, I am Steve Hounsel, Chair of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. I'd like to welcome all of you to our Ontario Biodiversity Summit, Nature-Based Solutions for the 21st Century. I also want to briefly introduce you to the Ontario Biodiversity Council, now in its 16th year and the host of this summit. We are a provincial level organization that has come together to achieve the vision and higher order goals and targets that have been set by Ontario's biodiversity strategy a 10-year strategy that aligns with the Global Strategic Plan for Biological Diversity and its associated IACHI targets. That strategy is a blueprint championed by Council for an ecologically sustainable future for Ontario, its biodiversity and its people, something we believe is well worth pursuing. We occupy a unique space that links global biodiversity targets with both national efforts and more local implementation efforts. We are working to mainstream biodiversity across all sectors and at all scales in an effort to protect what sustains us. 
it is embodied in the very membership of council with some 38 organizations from a broad constituency of industry and industry associations, conservation and environmental groups, natural heritage institutions, academia, indigenous organizations, and the provincial government, all united around the theme of protecting what sustains us, our biodiversity. So again, I welcome you to our virtual summit. We hope that the summit will connect people from across Ontario, Canada, and around the world to talk about celebrate and most importantly take action to protect biodiversity and advance nature-based solutions for a more sustainable future for all you'll be hearing about the alarming state of biodiversity at multiple scales including from here in ontario and the absolute need to bend the curve on biodiversity loss as we pursue a new deal of people living in harmony with nature it is also an issue that is intertwined both in causation and in solutions with climate change and the pursuit of sustainable development goals, and hence our focus on nature-based solutions. More importantly, you will be hearing about practical solutions to move us towards a more inspired future for all. Remember, the future is all about choices, choices that we collectively make. We will be hosting a number of webinar sessions starting in late May and ending in October. You can find descriptions and outlines of each session on our website, ontariobiodiversitycouncil.ca. We encourage you to register for as many as you can, and yes, they are free. I believe there is something in this summit for just about everyone. We have brought together leading edge thinkers and experts on biodiversity, together with practitioners from many fields to help lead the way towards meaningful, practical, and cost-effective solutions. Let's this be the start of an inspired journey to a more sustainable future. We also realize that we need many perspectives, and most notably, indigenous perspectives, knowledge, and connectedness to nature in order to achieve the transformative change that we so desperately need to address the issues of biodiversity loss and climate change and the pursuit of sustainable development. Now, this was not a small undertaking. It takes a lot of work and organization to pull off such an event. I want to thank our summit planning team and session leads from the Ontario Biodiversity Council. These folks have been working tirelessly for months to bring this summit together. Thank you so much for getting us to where we are. In particular, I want to thank Sarah Rang, Executive Director, and Colin Cassis of the Invasive Species Center for hosting our webinar sessions. It is a huge and much appreciated contribution. And a very special thank you to our sponsors. Sponsors like Ontario Power Generation and Ducks Unlimited Canada, among others. It is because of their collective support that this summit is happening. I also want to respectfully recognize, recognize the lands where we reside and from where we work. Since time immemorial, the Indigenous peoples were self-reliant and well provided for through their own ingenuity and use of the gifts of the land, living in harmony with the balance of nature. We, the Ontario Biodiversity Council, acknowledge that the land where we meet on and strive to protect is the territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples, but now is home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. That is also true for the many people participating in our summit who may be residing on unceded lands. I'd also like to recognize the critically important role of our Indigenous peoples in conserving biodiversity as teachers of traditional knowledge for promoting and enlightening us on ethical space and two-wide seeing and as valued members of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. I'd now like to ask Dorothy Taylor, Elder, Water Walker, and Knowledge Keeper of Curve Lake First Nation to share some important words with all of you. And first, by way of introduction, Dorothy Taylor is a Mississauga Ojibwe Elder from Curve Lake First Nation. She is known for her work and traditional teachings about the sacredness of water. She shares traditional knowledge and ceremony within her community and various organizations throughout Ontario. She is a hand drummer and a singer. Elder Dorothy Taylor is the founder of the Sacred Water Circle, inspired by traditional Indigenous teachings and leading with hope and spiritual courage. The Sacred Water Circle sees a restored relationship between human communities and water. She has served as a volunteer in the Petroglyph Advisory Council of Curve Lake for 12 years. Currently, 
Dorothy is the co-chair of the local United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation, sponsored by the Kawartha World Issue Center. She lives in Curve Lake with her husband, Mark, and two sons. Over to you, Dorothy. Oh, to me, Quat, Steve. Nimki Kapanashi Quan, Dishna Kaz, Wabagog Dodem, or Shkikamong Donjaba. Gitchenandam Sanongam, Minka Kinamage Al Sagil Sagil Sustainable Development, should call that. My name is Dorothy Taylor, and I'm very, very happy to be here and be invited to be speaking regarding uh, indigenous environmental knowledge to such an uh, esteemed group of people who have worked so hard and care so much for our natural world. I was asked to, to share a little bit about, about my, my understanding of in, uh, indigenous environmental knowledge. And first of all, what I want to say about that is as indigenous people, and I'm talking uh, around the world, the globe, that that we see, uh, we feel, and we interact with the natural world, more of a, a familial relationship. As you know, we refer to the globe of of Mother Earth as mother. We call her mother. When we look gaze upon the sun in the sky, uh, we refer to the sun as grandfather. And when we look upon the moon night sky, the moon is grandmother. And all the trees and animals and six insects and, and the birds, okay. they're our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Okay. So you see how we have a familial relationship with the land. Not necessarily a stewardship, because in our stories of creation, water was created first. The land was created next, and everything else was created that lives upon this world. But it was the human people, us, the four colors of men, that came to this, this land, the Mother Earth experience, I call it, because we're only here for a short time. We were here last. And so we have, they welcomed us as the children of the Earth. So when we refer to our interaction with the natural world as stewards, to me, the word steward is, is the definition as, you know, as maybe something in which a person control or organizes uh, their interaction with the world. And, you know, that's not our, our job. Our we have to have a different perspective on how we interact with the land and with the water. Because to indigenous people, the, the, the water itself has a spirit, a living spirit. And, it, and the lakes, the oceans, the rivers, even the water that falls from the sky, it is, it is, it is the, the veins of Mother the Earth. And when we interact with the water, our elders say that we must show gratitude to the, or speak gratitude towards the water. So many of you who, who work on the land and you're always near water, say on a daily basis in your language, be it English, Korean, Chinese, Italian, or Ojibwe, which is miigwech, say miigwech to, the, to that water. It hears us and it has a memory. In terms of the land and the trees and the air and the fire, you know, this is, these are elements that must be treated with respect. So we have more of a, a spiritual relationship with the land. It's more than a, an element. It's more than a, it, it goes beyond being a resource. We actually have a spiritual familial relationship with the land. So as uh, the four colors of men, we must 
all remember our original directions as we left the creator side. And just in brief, brief, brief reference to one of a certain part of our creation story. The white race was given the, the, the obligation to look after the air. The, the yellow race to look after the element of fire. The black race to look after the element of, fire, of, of water. And the, the red race to look after the land. As native people in the, in the on Turtle Island, which is the, the continent of North America, we believe that we still remember our obligation and that's the obligation to the land. As you know, many, as you, when you turn on the TV and you, you're, you look on the news, it's always the indigenous people who are leading me, many of those protests uh, and, uh, on oil and, and mining and, and forestry and such, because we believe that there are certain places on our land that have a spiritual power it's a sacred place, sacred meaning it has a connection to the higher power. So what I shared with you today in, in conclusion is that what, number one, we have a familiar relationship to the land. We believe that land, water, sky and air, that's, they have, they are, are, we have a spiritual relationship with it, with, the, with creation. And also, it's very important that on a daily basis, we speak gratitude towards those gifts the Creator gave us. And that we're not necessarily stewards of the land, but, most, but primarily, we must live in harmony. And, and, and we have to live in, a, in a, a balanced relationship with the land. So what I shared with you this today, I just hope that what our elders from present and beyond and, and, and pr prior who have taught me the little bit that, I, that I'm sharing with you today, that this will help you in the work as you go forward as professionals and in the work that you do. So I say miigwech for chamiigwech for inviting me and to sharing a little bit that I know. And I, and I wish you luck and have fun on, on this uh, uh, biodiversity and this group that you're, this conference that you're participating in webinar. Now miigwech, miigwech. So good morning, everyone. I trust Mike and Colin that uh, I am visible and I can begin. If you can give me some indication. We're all good there, Mark. Okay, well, thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce the topic this morning. My name is Mark Reeser. I am a farmer from Southwest of Kitchener, uh, Vice President of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture and a member of the Biodiversity Council. <clears throat> now you may wonder what biodiversity has to do with agriculture. We typically look at biodiversity in the context of the natural landscape, the bush, the wetlands, the rivers, the lakes, the grasslands, the wildlands uh, of Canada and the world. But agricultural food production uh, covers, in fact, the majority of the landscape in places like southwestern Ontario and in other places in the world. So what does biodiversity look like in agriculture? And I've identified a number of things that uh, um, I think are important with regard to agriculture and biodiversity. So I'm going to list them as a, as a preface and as an introduction. Biodiversity of crop species is important. There was a time beginning in the 1960s uh, when monoculture became the prevalent uh, way of cropping in North America. Uh, machinery and technology allowed us to grow corn and corn appeared from fence row to fence row. And while that was profitable for a period of time for farmers, we soon came to the conclusion that soil quality uh, began to suffer. And so we looked at ways uh, to uh, 
fix that issue. And it became apparent that uh, growing more than one crop in a rotation uh, was important, both to soil quality and for long-term yield. So what was formerly all corn became corn and sometimes soybeans, and sometimes wheat was added to the rotation. And we are now realizing that a longer rotation that includes things like hay and a legume or a grass uh, is also beneficial to the rotation. So it's valuable the more species in the rotation, probably the more valuable it is. Now this isn't new, a uh, hundred years ago, all farmers did this. We kind of lost that ability to rotate and have long rotations. And the indigenous people who lived here for thousands of years practiced it. They grew the three sisters, the corn, the soybeans, and the squash, all in that hill. So uh, biodiversity in cropping is not new. Uh, it's old. We seem to have lost it for a period of time, and hopefully we found it again. Secondly, biodiversity within crop species has value. If you're old enough to remember back to the early 1970s, there was a disease of corn called blight that affected a significant portion of the corn grown in North America, and it was devastating. And the reason why it was so devastating is because most of the corn grown had the same genetic base and the same limited number of genes that came from the same parents. And uh, that left that crop vulnerable to a disease. And we realized that we needed biodiversity within the species of corn in order to protect us from diseases that affect some genes and not others. Thirdly, wider diversity of species also has value. So adding livestock to a rotation improves the biome of the soil by adding uh, microbes to the biomass and also provides nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And again, the indigenous people knew this. Uh, I had mentioned the three sisters before, the growing of corn, uh, beans, and squash in that hill. Uh, but what sometimes is forgotten that there is actually a fourth member of that family. And I guess you call it perhaps the, the brother and the three sisters, or maybe the four sisters. Uh, often when it was available, indigenous peoples uh, buried a, a, a dead fish in that hill before they planted uh, you know, the corn, the, soybeans, the corn, the beans, and the squash. And uh, the purpose of that was, and, and they realized this, that that fish added nutrients uh, to, that, to that soil so that the crops could grow better. Uh, so additional species uh, add uh, different microbes and different nutrients to the soil, uh, which are beneficial in the long term. And I hope that uh, later this morning, uh, Mike Swiderski will talk about uh, his rotation where he has uh, uh, livestock in the rotation. Fourthly, diversity of, diversity of livestock species themselves has value. So additional species add new microbes and nutrients to the soil. And again, Mike will talk about using both cattle and sheep in his rotation. And finally, diversity within livestock species has value. And we tend to forget this. I'm a turkey farmer. Two varieties of turkey in the world represent 90% of the consumption in the world. So only two varieties. Um, that's dangerous, I would suggest, uh, in, in the dairy industry. Uh, you're probably familiar with that black, black and white cow called Holstein. Well, approximately 80% of all the milk produced in North America comes from that single species. Now, this hasn't always been the case. Uh, where there were once hundreds of varieties of livestock species, today there are uh, far fewer, and many of these are actually endangered. Um, and I'll give you an example, which is probably not widely known. Uh, and this is the Clydesdale horse, and I just learned this recently. They're actually on the verge of extinction. There are only a few breeders left in the entire world, and uh, that gene pool uh, has, has uh, shrunk to such an extent that it is difficult to find animals to breed. And if you're not familiar with that breed, those horses, those Clydesdale horses, are the ones that lead the Budweiser team that you see, for instance, at the Super Bowl. So there are two things that I'd like you to take away from today. Uh, and they are these. 
Today's focus on biodiversity in agriculture is not meant to necessarily provide a solution to the worldwide issue of reduced diversity, but as a vindication that there is merit in using, enhancing, maintaining, and promoting biodiversity throughout the landscape. And secondly, biodiversity is foundational to a healthy and sustainable environment and to a sustainable future for agriculture. So now a little bit of housework, uh, excuse me, housekeeping before we begin our, our seminar. I would ask that presenters please ensure that your mic and your camera is off unless you are speaking. And uh, the audience is free to ask questions using the question mark function on your screen and they will be read out if there is time. So it's now my uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mike Swiderski, our first presenter. And, and Mike is one of those uh, unique individuals, a unique farmer who is not afraid to be different. And I have great respect for that. People who experiment and do things that are perhaps considered to be outside of the norm are, are people who actually drive innovation. And I think that's fascinating. And I, I hope that you will uh, I'd be fascinated as I am, as Mike tells his story. And so, uh, Mike, if we were uh, together in person, I, I would say to the audience now, please join me in, in welcoming you. So you won't be able to hear any applause, but if you could imagine it, that would be great. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Mike, please go ahead. Awesome. All right. Good morning, everyone. I trust you can. I trust you can hear me. Um, so, Mike Swiderski. Um, just other Mike. I'm. I'm having trouble seeing my screen here. Yep. We can. We can hear you, and uh, you should have control of the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. And I, I'm not seeing that, Mike. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, a background slide, um, and there should be controls in the bottom left control. Yep, there we go. Here we go. I see that now. So, okay. I think, I think we're good here. So, yeah. Well, there we go. I'm getting the hang of this. Yeah, so thank you everyone. Um, I'm happy to happy to be here today. I'm gonna roll right through this uh, in respect with, for everybody's time today. So here we go. Um, so I and myself and my wife, we're first generation farms on our, on, on our farm here in Melanchthon Township. Um, we've been here since 2004. Um, today, our farm operation consists of several different enterprises. I manage the local community pasture, the Great Dufferin Community Pasture, where we, we graze about 600 steers and heifers in, in two different groups. We also custom graze some cattle on our owned and rented farms in the area as well. I do provide a bit of uh, consulting services for a broiler breeder chicken producer. And on our farm as well, my wife, uh, she operates an on-farm flower business, um, specializing in local and farm-grown blooms. So about an acre of flowers we have here as well. And as I mentioned, we're in Melanchthon. And not many people know where Melanchthon is. It's our, our municipality is the name of our township. So we're up in the, the Dundalk, Shelburne area. Um, for those grain farmers, we're sitting at about 2,400 corn heat units. We're 510 meters of elevation or just under 1,700 feet. And in our area, we're the headwaters to the Grand River, the Saugeen, the Ottawa Saga, and the Humber, Humber Rivers. So we're in the top of the, the, top of the watershed. So I'm just going to give a quick view of what we do on our farm, and then I'm going to go into some some uh, building re resilience and and improving biodiversity on my farm and 
and some other opportunities I see in, in my neighborhood as well. So our farm is 100% perennial pasture. We don't grow any, any crops. We don't till any ground. It's all perennial pasture, most of it being 40 years plus seeded. Some of it, nobody, nobody can remember when it was, when that ground was tilled. So in January, um, we, we went, we start winter feeding our sheep flock and we don't have, keep any cattle at all in the, in the winter, just during the, during the growing season. Um, so we feed every, every three or four days. Um, sheep, because they're quite uh, desert animals, we don't provide water. They get enough moisture from, from the snow. Uh, we start breeding around January 1st. Um, so in the winter, we, we just try to maintain body condition on our sheep. So we try to get them in good condition coming into the winter. There's lots of, so we don't feed in the barn. We feed out in the field different field every year to to spread our nutrients around very little competition and we do not get overly excited about wasting a bit of feed as that is a great uh provides great nutrition for for our ground so we unroll primarily unroll round bales of hay and it sort of looks like the photo on on, on my left there the sheep Sheep have lots of feed. They eat it down. They there's a litter of manure and 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 hay left on the ground. And the the photo that that would be probably around the mid, mid April. The snow melts underneath the snow and and the grass starts to grow up up through that that litter we we laid down there. And and that photo is is. That would be kind of 1st of June, that the, the mic soil microbes are breaking down all that, all that, all that uh, wasted, wasted hay we left there. There's an ant in the photo. There's, there's mushrooms growing in there. If you can see the tiny little mushrooms, it is just a, there's a, there's creature, if you stick your face right in there, there's creatures running around, there's dew worms and uh, in it, that fo other photo with the ATV that was taken around the first of June, so it just explodes with with uh, great production. Um, our our pasture grasses, um, as I mentioned, they're they're most of them are around forty plus years seeded down. We get continue to get increased production on them, and they they're continuing to become more diverse. We have about 30, 30 species of grasses, legumes, and for, forbs that are that are in our pasture stands right now. Some of that differs depending on is it a wet spot or is, is it a higher ground or, or is it pr more protected or more prone to wind. So it's become it's becoming more diverse over over time. We also provide uh, portable windbreaks for our sheep in the winter. It allows them to to get out of the wind. Um, we are in a, a we do have good, but um, but we but but we do um, we do have really strong hard winds being at the top of the top of the the world here with our elevation. Okay, I'm having trouble advancing that slide, Mike. Thank you. Uh, and a question I constantly ask myself is, is, is outdoor feeding, is it safe for, for both the livestock and, and for, for the environment? So I think it's important that, that I always choose a good location that's not prone to run off. Um, have a backup plan in case things go bad. If we start getting heavy, heavy rain in the winter, maybe maybe I'll have to to move them to a different different location. Um, look for some wind protection. Monitor, check, make sure everything's good, 
and adjust if need be. Next slide, please. March and April, when the frost, when the snow melts and the frost comes out of the ground, we'll move them to the very highest ground that's close to buildings for us. We uh, will give them a small area and we'll feed on that for probably a week and then move on. Uh, we don't want the sheep out eating grass too early in the year because they'll they'll actually do some damage to the grass and they'll lose body weight because they love grass so much, even if they're not getting enough for, to meet the nutritional requirements they'll go hunting for it. We keep our uh, replacement ewes in a different area in the, in, in, in a, a, a yard in the, around our barnyard. And uh, we start moving them out as soon as the snow is melted in order to get them in really good physical condition for, for when they're delivering their first lambs. Next slide, please. So come May, we sh we share our use. The user, we stop feeding them for the winter. And we move them to grass, check fences, and our ewe lambs start to land. Next slide. Um, so we start lambing about the 23rd of May. So when we do that, we we actually split our flock in half and uh, and have them lamb in two groups. They will uh, they provide they if when they're lambing they move to their own section in the field and, and deliver their lambs and can stay there up to a couple days if they need need to on their own. Um, they don't require a lot of grass at that time of year because the grass is so so. Um, Sorry, they don't require a lot of water because the grass is so full of moisture. So when the lambs are are strong, the mothers will take the lambs and 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 uh, move to water when they need to. Um, we this year we lambed over 18 days, and and that's that's how long it took us to lamb all our all 400 ewes. So it was a really good quick time. Next slide, please. So in July and August, um, we can, and as, as the grass grows, we continue to increase our stock density. So we would normally have a hundred head of cattle on, on an acre at a time. Sometimes we're moving daily, sometimes we're moving usually not more than two days in one area. And what that does is it concentrates, they become non-selective, they'll eat all the grass. It allows us to graze that grass as short or as tall as we want, and um, and it provide and it makes a nice even spread of the manure through the field. Um, and at that time too, we try to when on the farm that we have sheep on, we try to have the cattle graze between periods for the sheep because the cattle will clean the parasites on their grass for the sheep. Um, we don't mind grazing mature grass because we only allow them to eat the, the most nutrition, nutritious portion and then, then, um, and then tramp the rest. Next slide, please. And here's kind of what high density grazing looks like. So we would have 400 ewes and their lambs all on, a, on about two acres for two days. And, and they, they, eat, they eat everything fairly flat. We do leave quite a bit of residual. So they probably, if you flipped it up, there'd probably still be four inches of grass there. And we'll do the, do the same for the cattle. And this is, this is the ultimate carbon sequestration, grasslands, healthy grasslands, um, providing diversity and, and and this is in organic matter. So we are, our soil organic matter is right touching 7%. And I think our, the neighbors in this area, their, their organic matter is around four. So we're, we're building organic matter. Next slide, please. 
And this is just illustrates again what it can look like. You can see the tall grass in the background, and it's just they've gotten quite a they've eaten a fair bit, but they've also flattened it. That keeps the soil covered, conserves moisture, provides wonderful, wonderful habitat for all the soil, soil bacteria and, and nematodes and all the soil creatures. Spreads the nutrients evenly. Um, and as we find the more we can, the more we more material we can put down on that grass surface. Um, it used to be it would take a while to break that stuff down, but now within 60 days, you'll there'll be no manure present and you'll hardly even see any of that great grass laying on the ground. That the 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 cycling, the nutrient cycling is 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 getting better every year. Um it also Allowing that time to to um, to regrow after it, it is increasing our, our plant species diversification over time over time, and we're seeing other things like large groups of of of, of birds and that feed on the flies and insects flocks that flocks of even starlings which usually aren't anybody's favorite bird they're almost darkening the sky um, looking for birds and insects. While we're while we're grazing with these larger groups, next slide, please. And now I'm going to sort of go on to ways that I'm that we're trying to increase improve biodiversity and, and some of the other things I'm seeing in the neighborhood, and and also some some uh, possibilities. And I know I understand that some of these things I'm going to talk about here are really going to stretch people's um, paradigms. Um, and, and what what they what we consider normal, and I think that's probably why most of us are here are are here today. Um, so improve as as was mentioned by Mark earlier, adding plants to to or sorry livestock to cropland. And here here's a photo of of just simply grazing sheep on on my crop neighbors' corn stalks after. So putting putting Grazing cover crops or or crop residue, and we've been doing this for a few years, and we we really really like it. Next slide, please. And here here we are um, grazing. This is red clover, um, which is was planted in into winter wheat. So that was a winter wheat crop. Um, if it's close enough to home, we'll, we'll just walk the sheep down the road. And this is one of my favorite things: is we grow really great perennial grasses, but these annuals and annuals and biennial crops they provide really exceptional nutrients, uh, real to very nutrient dense stuff late in the year. And we last year we grazed uh, red clover from for 60 days, September to November, walk the sheep home in the snow. And getting those animals on that that cropland is so good for the animals, and it's also just adds a whole another dimension to this cropland. Next slide, please. And multi-species grazing. I, and I've got the bees there. I know they don't graze, but it's it's just adding another aspect. Having multi-species grazing, the the sheep and the cattle together. The sheep eat sort of a lower profile on the grass, and the and the cattle will eat eat uh, eat eat a high higher part of that grass, and it sort of promotes a diversity in those grass stands. Different plants grow, and there's also, as far as the financial side, there, there's definitely an economy that you can almost feed 10% of either cattle or sheep if you graze them together on the same on the same plant base. In New Zealand, it's very common for the beef farmers to have 10% sheep, the sheep farmers to have 10% um, cattle. And it, it's a great synergy and it's, it, it works really well. And, and also for that, uh, for that cleaning of the, of, the, of the parasites for each other. In that picture with the cattle on the left, you can, you can see a bit of those large flocks of birds I was talking about. And, and that's just the blink of an eye of what it is. But that that goes on for 25, 30 seconds, and it's it's quite remarkable. 
Next slide, please. Using using uh, livestock to control to do weed control and property management. Um, there's some sheep grazing the side of the road. Um, another spot grazing some brush here pasture that that needed a little more attention. Um, I've also talked to the municipality about grazing county land and, and stuff like that. They're somewhat open to it. It's just a matter of, of uh, having enough time to do things like that. But that would, provide, would be a good way to provide good uh, increased biodiversity. Next slide, please. And here's a photo. This this is these are my my colleagues Chris and and Lindsay from the Ottawa Valley. They're grazing. They're using their sheep to to um, graze solar farms to keep the. At one time, that was all done mechanically with mowers, keeping keeping the weeds out of the panels. And now they're now they're they're grazing several hundred acres uh, of, of of solar panels. You know, now providing the providing a great environment and also providing some some meat and fiber at the same process at, at the same time as 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 some some energy. Next slide, please. Um, and I think also the maintenance of grasslands in a in our parks and conservation areas. Now here, that's a photo of of uh, Luther Marsh, their their grassland habitat, and you know it it looks beautiful. This is probably the most beautiful little look. It's got lots of goldenrod and asters. There's a little bit of bird's foot trefoil growing in there, but otherwise there's not a whole lot. And you can see the 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 willows growing in the background. Next slide, please. Willows, willows growing. There's very, very few species in there. It's really not great grassland bird habitat. I didn't see at, at our home farms. We're seeing tons of meadow larks still this time of year. There's no meadow larks in there, and the the the, the material that's laying on the top is very stale. I could probably see three years worth of worth of of of, of goldenrod. That's laying on the top, and it's 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 succession is occurring, and and the grasslands are are decreasing in there. Next slide, please. And the current solution is is mowing, and this was right side by side, um, so it's mowed. There's, you know, that's that's a hundred dollar an acre job right there, um, and I think inter the introduction of of some some cows or some some ruminant livestock in there would would really would really enhance the biodiversity the the bugs that the cattle bring the, the biology and their manure um would really would really benefit something like this there's a if there's a great story um of the grassman grassman grasslands national park in saskatchewan it was grazed by lots of cows in there. They introduced buffalo, kicked the cows out, and instantly the the uh, the endangered species left with the cattle. And they they did bring the cattle back into that park, and is now it's thriving more than ever. And as well as their increasing herd of buffalo. So this, if managed correctly, can be can be an awesome awesome fit. I think. Next slide, please. And also, I think silviculture, the grazing of trees. This was just down the road, from Luther Marsh as well. Some white pine trees. They look really good from the road, nice and green. But when you take two steps in, they're very. There's not a whole lot going on there. The floor, the floor, of the woodlot is 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 piled up with pine needles. And there's very very little green on those trees. There's it, there's a there's a Charlie Brown Christmas tree at the top, and that's it. The rest is it's just too dense in there. Next slide, please. 
and this is this is some of the passages we have. Obviously, you know, an older stands of poplar, but uh, my colleague in Simcoe, Ontario, Carrie Woolley, she has really tackled this silviculture, and they have done some really awesome, awesome work raising not only her orchards, but but uh, improving some of their their woodlots to to grow grass, thin them a little bit. And it is just a, it is just an amazing transformation. And I know it's not overly popular. For for years and years, we were told we you shouldn't have cattle anywhere near trees. But have managed it similar to how we're managing our open fields to to monitor what's going on. Uh, I think it's a it's a really exciting exciting management tool we have. Next slide. And that's all I have. I, I, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So if uh, anyone has questions, you're free to put them in that uh, question mark box up there in the top right-hand corner. At least that's the way it is on my screen. Um, and in the meantime, I will say thank you very much to Mike. Um, Mike, you said a bunch of things that uh, I found, uh, like I said before, fascinating, and uh, I'll just mention a couple of them. The, the first is that 30 species in your uh, in your pasture. Um, I, I think that's uh, that's something special, and um, and the fact that they've been there for 40 years. Um, I have some pasture that's been there for 10 years, and I, I think I'm doing okay. But uh, 40 years and uh, 30 species—that's amazing. And the fact that you have 7% organic matter, I suspect that that 7% organic matter rivals what you would find in virgin land, uh, you know, underneath your bush. Uh, and uh, to have that amount of organic matter, I think is something that um, we as farmers should take note of. Uh, we do have the capacity to sequester an enormous amount of carbon and probably be part of the solution uh, to excess carbon. Uh, not only in Canada, but in the world. Uh, so, Mike, uh, thank you very much for stretching our paradigms. I like your wording. And uh, th thanks also for your uh, comments with regard to uh, utilizing other farmers' land, including um, their cover crops and, uh, and the land where they grow corn and soybeans and so on. Uh, thank you again. Uh, it's been great to listen to you. And uh, thank you for what you do. And uh, continue. And I hope uh, everyone who's listening has uh, gained something from uh, what you said. Appreciate it. Thanks again. And I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not in control here, so I can't see if there are any questions. So I'll leave that up to uh, Mike if there are any. Are, are there any, Mike? I not don't have any right now. I, I'm sorry, what was that? Sorry, I don't see any questions for right now. Okay, then I'll, I'll say thank you again to Mike. I appreciate it. And uh, I will, uh, I guess it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Danny Glantz. Uh, Danny is a senior researcher with OFA, and uh, she will uh, continue on with the seminar. Uh, thank you, Danny. Go ahead. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction, and thanks, Mike, for that great presentation. A uh, lot of awesome information that came from that. And thanks everybody for tuning into our panel presentations. Uh, the topic for today is best management practices and future opportunities for mainstreaming biodiversity within agriculture. So I'm really excited. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers and I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank them all for taking the time to be here with us today. I know you guys lead very busy schedules and have made a lot of uh, effort to join us. So I'm looking forward to all your presentations. Uh, just as a quick note, time permitting, uh, panelists will answer a few questions from audience members if they're there after their presentation. And as Mark mentioned earlier, for those of you just joining, uh, please use the question function found on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, so questions will be read out if there's time after the speaker. Um, if not, we'll make sure to get those questions answered and send them out to our uh, uh, audience after the session is done. 
So first, I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist, uh, Maria Ramirez Geraldo, who will be speaking to us on the environmental farm plan and its role in the conservation of biodiversity. Since 2016, Maria has been a programs analyst with the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. The OSCIA is a grassroots farming organization that delivers a number of education and cost share programs to the farming community. Maria manages the delivery of the Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Lands and the Species at Risk Farm Incentive Program. She has also supported the delivery of various other environmental stewardship programs and coordinates the Electronic Environmental Farm Plan platform. Maria is currently a board member of the Carolinian Canada Coalition, representing OSCIA, and is completing the Advanced Agricultural Leadership Program, otherwise known as ALP. Maria has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences degree from the University of Guelph with a major in Natural Resource Management. Take it away, Maria. Thank you, Danny, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm very uh, pleased to be here today. So let's see here. There we are. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, like Danny mentioned, my name is Maria ramirez Geraldo. Um, I work for the Ontario Soil and Crop, and I'm going to give you a quick overview about the environmental farm plan and its role in the conservation of biodiversity. I'm just going to turn my camera off here so that you guys can see the screen uh, bigger. There we go. All right, so what's the environmental farm plan? The environmental farm plan is a voluntary self-assessment of 23 different areas of the farm. So what that means is it is quite a thick workbook um, with 23 chapters or worksheets, and it goes over 285 questions. That sounds like a lot, um, but I'll sort of guide you and, and show you a little bit of what it all entails. So those 285 questions uh, cover topics such as soil management, wetlands, wildlife, fertilizer handling and storage, water and energy efficiency, field crop management, horticultural production, pest management, and a few other topics. Um, the EFP was developed by farmers for farmers. It began in 1993 as a pilot project and it is currently in its fourth edition. About 70% of Ontario farmers have participated in the EFP and they have uh, some sort of addition. Most of them are now up to that fourth edition. The Ontario Soil and Crop delivers the environmental farm plan in three different formats currently. Um, the most popular one is the two-day in-person workshop, which is designed um, to get the farmer support um, in order to complete the workbook and also learn other the tools and supporting uh, programs out there. Um, it is all of the formats of the EFP are completely free to the farmer and the landowner who wishes to participate. There's also a one day renewal in person workshop, and that one is intended for those participants who had already completed a, a previous version of the EFP and then they just want to update it, which is recommended that it be done every five years because. Of course, as the years go by and um, programs or projects are being done on the farm, then things can be started to be um, updated and, and the ratings will change. And there is also the electronic environmental farm plan. Um, so that one is just a, a website containing basically the, the workbook and it's a little bit um, easier for some people who are a little bit further away or again they're trying to just do the update to their workbook um, to do it online. So what does the EFP self-assessment, what does it do? So in essence it will help the farmer see their farm in a new way. So it will give them um, sort of a different perspective other than the day-to-day -day activities and issues that come up. It will sort of give them this like bird's eye view of the whole farm and then look into things that perhaps they don't think about every day like woodlot management or perhaps how water and energy efficiency are actually um, impacting their their productivity and their everyday activities. Uh, it increases awareness about risks on the property 
um, identifies actions to reduce those risks. It will benefit the operation's productivity and profitability. It will reduce health and safety risks for the farmer, his family, and employees. And it will help uh, apply for cost share program funding and also learn about opportunities for support. So how is the process of completing an environmental farm plan? So like I mentioned, um, attending the two-day environmental workshop, especially if um, it's, it's, it is the first time that you're doing it, um, then you complete all applicable worksheets in the EFP workbook. Um, again, sometimes not all of the worksheets apply to everyone, depending on their commodity um, or the type of, of production systems that they have but at least 50% of that workbook will be needed to be filled out. Um, then after doing that, they will create an action plan to address identified risks. And then they will submit that workbook to the EFP um, workshop leader who will review it and verify it. And once that is done, the workshop leader will send back the workbook um, so that the farmer keeps it for their records and um, with a certificate of, com of completion. And then the farmer can go on to implement those action plans that they have identified. Okay, so just quickly, um, uh, this is uh, an example of one of the sheets um, in the workbook. So this is worksheet 21. And this one goes over stream stitch and floodplain management. So for each topic, in the environmental farm plan, there are four descriptions of either natural conditions or current situations, and each one has a number rating, like you see there at the top. So the best or four rating shows the conditions that protect the environment or have the lowest potential of environmental damage. That would be right there. Um, and then a one rating shows conditions that have the highest potential to affect the environment. So the farmer will check the conditions that base describes their farm. So in this case, um, we're gonna pretend that we're gonna do question number one there, which is about buffer strips and um, ditch bank stabilization. So depending on their current situation, in this case, uh, we're gonna say, well, there are no buffer strips in this one field. So that will give me a rating of one. And then because a rating of one and two um, will then trigger an action plan because there could be a potential risk um, to, to the environment and to the farm, then an action plan will be developed. Um, so for this example, the action plan will be that, um, whoops, that tree and grass buffer strips will be planted along the creek that is three to five meters wide. Um, and it'll be do, we'll be doing that within the next two years. So we want the producer or the farmer to come up with realistic goals um, to get them as close to that four rating as possible. And then um, something that it's, it's, we give them like a time frame so that that way they can go back and keep it again, realistic and attainable. So in essence, the goal of the EFP is to help identify and address environmental risks on the farm. But what this also entails is that we want the farmer uh, to be able to reach that balance between social, environmental, environmental and economic demands to make their farm more sustainable and adopt practices that they have not considered before, or also realize how well they're already doing. Um, so it can be that a lot of their ratings will be between that three and that four, which is amazing. So they're doing great. Um, and then they can choose to either uh, improve on those or just keep doing it the way they're doing and then just focus on those ratings that they get as one and twos. So a lot of the action plans that come out of the environmental farm plan could be supported by programs um, and cost share opportunities in the province. So whether that's through the municipality or conservation authorities or programs uh, that the Ontario Soil and Crop also delivers. And there's other organizations, of course, that, that have um, great programs out there. So I'm just gonna quickly run you through a couple of the ones that we deliver. And we do have the 
environmental farm plan is an eligibility criteria for these programs. So one of them is the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program, which was launched in 2018. And it is a five-year commitment by Canada's federal, provincial, and territorial governments. Um, the producers stream of the partnership covers three different like categories. So one is economic development, the other one is protection and assurance. Uh, but the one I, I'm going to expand a little bit on today is the environmental stewardship category. So the purpose of the environmental stewardship category uh, is to enhance water quality and soil health. And it does so by offering 13 best management practices um, that the producer or the farmer can apply to. Um, so the idea being that once you come out of the uh, workshop of the environmental farm plan and you come with ac your action plan, you're well set and you have some um, achievable goals that this program can help you with. So for example, um, it could aid in mitigating uh, climate change risks like um, the loss of topsoil through erosion because of like a heavy rain event, uh, which we have been seeing a lot of. And it can do that by um, if the farmer chooses to adopt uh, erosion control structures or the modification of equipment to reduce soil erosion. And it will also, of course, eventually increase the, uh, the water quality and then the soil health. Um, which, like Mike was mentioning, it will increase some of the soil microbes uh, and that biodiversity in the soil, which we want to see. Um, it can also help with drought, drought tolerance. So through adoption of projects like cover crops. Um, and then there's also fragile land retirement and windbreak and windstorm projects that will help supporting um, biodiversity habitat. And finally, we have the species at risk programs. So the Species at Risk Partnerships on Agricultural Lands is an Environment and Climate Change Canada um, funded program. It offers seven best management practices or project categories that the farmer can apply to, and it targets 12 species at risk, which are the ones that you see there on the pictures, uh, and they're mainly grass, grassland species. Um, so some of the projects that the producer could apply to could be tree and shrub planting, uh, grassland or wetland restoration, fencing to either do rotational grazing or to exclude livestock out of woodlots, um, and delay haying. And it covers, uh, it funds up to 50% of eligible project costs. And then we also have the Species Service Farm Incentive Program, um, which has been around since 2008 and is currently funded by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And SARFIP offers 13 best management practice categories um, to target all species at risk found in agricultural lands in Ontario. And that one funds at 45, 60%, depending on um, the level of the, the detail in the application forms. And there is a 15% bonus for those participants who would like to um, have a conservation biologist come onto the property to assess how well those best management practices are doing and um, monitor for species at risk. So the idea being that some of the projects that I have mentioned, some of those best management practices, perhaps the farmer was sort of thinking about it, a neighbor had already implemented some of those, um, but doing the environmental farm plan will get them thinking and actually write down uh, specific targets and goals to accomplish some of that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Great. Thanks so much, Maria, for the wonderful presentation. Um, and thanks for including your contact information. Um, so if anybody has some questions that they think of for Maria after the, uh, this session is all done, um, please feel free to email us or directly uh, Maria at her contact information listed there. Um, it's really awesome to see how the EFP and other programs play a critical role in the conservation conservation of biodiversity on farm and how they work to balance social and economical demands. So thank you for that, Maria. So 
if anybody has any questions for Maria, please feel free to use the, the question function on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, I'm not seeing any right now, Maria, but uh, if any come in, um, I'll save them for the end if we have time and uh, ask you then. So thanks again. So our next speaker is uh, Nigel Rain, uh, who will be speaking to us on pollinator-friendly agricultural practices. Uh, thanks, Nigel, for taking the time to be here with us today. Nigel is a global leader in the fields of animal behavior, pollination ecology, and pollinator conservation. He is the Rebanks Family Chair in Pollinator Conservation at the University of Guelph, a position endowed by the Weston Family Foundation. Nigel's work combines internationally excellent research, significant engagement with policymakers, and other conservation relevant stakeholder groups, and teaching the world's first pollinator conservation course. Before moving to Canada in 2014, he studied at the University of Oxford, worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sheffield and Queen Mary University of London, and held his first faculty position at Royal Holloway University of London. He's an elected fellow of both the Royal Entomological Society and the Linnean Society of London. In 2014, Nigel was recognized as a World Economic Forum Young Scientist, one of 40 outstanding researchers under the age of 40, and was elected to the College of New Scholars of the Royal Society of Canada in 2017. Thanks for joining us today, Nigel. The floor is yours. Thanks for having me. Uh, do you have my slides? They were just momentarily up on the screen. Uh, let's see if we can get them back on. Hi, Nigel. It's uh, Mike from ISC. Um, we do not have your slides, so we're going to need you oh, okay. to share your screen. OK, I can do that. So uh, let me find. Sorry about this, everybody. So you want me to share shops? So show screen. Yes. Is that going to work? Okay. Can you see my slides now? Not just yet, unfortunately. Okay, so could you talk me through how I'm supposed to be sharing these? I'm I'm having some problems. I'm sorry. That's okay, Mike. Yeah, that should be on me. Um bear with me here while I'm working through this. Like it's Colin here in the background, just uh, happy to help as well. I, I'm going to make uh, Nigel the panelist, uh, who is a panelist now a presenter. So, Nigel, you might get a prompt in a second. Just uh, hold tight there. Yep, I, I just did that. Okay, great. And so that should welcome you to to start sharing your screen in a second. I think I've done that. Have I have I got that right? Are they showing now? Uh, not just yet, but I, I think we're getting close here. Just uh... okay. I'll I'll be patient. <laughs> so everyone, while while we're trying to get the slides sorted out, I, I would like to uh, just do a, a quick land acknowledgement and say that we at the University of Guelph acknowledge that the university resides on the ancestral, ancestral lands of the Atawandaran people and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant to this land and offer our respects to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Métis neighbors as we try and strengthen our relations with them. 
Um, obviously, it's important given that both our, our university and the farms that we work on are on those lands. How are we doing, Mike? Hello. Hi there, Hi there. Hi there. Oh, sorry, Mike, you go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was going to pass it off to you, Colin. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, just hold, hold tight here, Nigel. We'll, uh, there we go. Uh, Mike, was that you? Uh... Yes. Um, okay. So, I think. No, okay. Not. Here we go. Okay. I think we should be good there. Um, Nigel, can you uh, advance the slides? Uh, yeah, let me just try that. Hang on. Yep. Does that work? Can you uh, try advancing another slide? So working? Uh, bear with us here while we uh, sort through this technical issue. Do you, do you want to maybe move to the next speaker and then we can sort this out in the background or what do you want to do? I, I, I'm aware people are probably getting bored with us sorting yeah. out. <laughs> I, I, I can advance the slides. So if you want to start presenting and let me know when you want to transition between slides, we can proceed. Okay, great. So everyone can see my slides. Thank you. So it's great to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about pollinator friendly agricultural practices. Next slide, please. So why should we care about pollinators? Well, uh, if you go to the grocery store, this is what you want to see. You want to see this diversity of fruits, vegetables and nuts. Next slide, please. Uh, and without pollinators, uh, we see that the, this uh, grocery store looks much more depauperate. We lose many of those different types of produce that we're used to seeing, in addition to many other important commodities like coffee and chocolate. Uh, we know that pollinators have an important role to play in foodstuffs that we feed to um, livestock as well. And the, the average uh, value of uh, pollination services globally is about 700 billion Canadian dollars per year for, for around the world. Um, that, that equates to roughly uh, the poll um, pollinators are important for pollinating around 76% of uh, food crops around the world uh, of the different types of food crops and they're obviously hugely economically important and we are um, dependency on pollinators is actually increasing so I think from a very selfish point of view from an agricultural point of view we can we can consider that pollinators are, are very very important next slide please but it's not just about agriculture, it's also about uh, about plant communities and the diversity of pollinators that we see. You can see here uh, bees and butterflies and moths and hummingbirds and uh, hoverflies and beetles and wasps and other taxa that visit flowers and use those and pollinate those flowers. We estimate that roughly 90% uh, of flowering plant species around the world, of which there are over 350,000, rely to some degree on animal vectored pollination. So those pollinators are making those plant, are supporting those plant communities, the reproduction of those plant communities. So they're really, really important in terrestrial ecosystems. Next slide, please. So this, this sort of schematic that comes from the Pollinator Partnership, which is a really nice one, actually is kind of the crux of my talk. Um, it, it really outlines a number of the uh, types of mitigations and, and strategies that uh, that farmers can undertake uh, in Canada and elsewhere to support pollinators and support the pollination services they provide. Uh, can you click on once more? We know that uh, we know that pollinators globally are, are under threat, and there are multiple um, there are multi multiple environmental stresses that are affecting pollinators. And key amongst those is probably the amount of habitat that they have, so the amount of flowers that they have to visit, the places they have to nest, and how fragmented that habitat has become in many of our sort of anthropogenic, any of our human change landscapes. And obviously. Uh, agriculture has changed substantially in, in recent decades, uh, field sizes have increased, machinery has got larger, and, uh, and, and areas that are outside of those field, uh, fields have become smaller. So thinking about areas like what we can see in these, um, these areas that are surrounded by red boxes, 
that we can talk about uh, maintaining plantings around watersheds, uh, wetland areas. Uh, we can look at creating habitat on marginal lands around fields, um, keeping woodlots and keeping areas of forest fragment uh, so that we have dead wood for, for many of the cavity nesting bees to use, intercropping, so putting plantings in between crops where that's possible, things like orchards, um, and, and generally adding in marginal land strips. Next slide, please. We can also see that there are other environmental stresses. Uh, we know that, that pesticides are, uh, are used extensively in agriculture and, and have been for many decades. Um, uh, we know that they're used and they're very effective at controlling insect pests, but because many of the pollinators that we're looking at are also insects and have very similar physiologies and behaviors, that uh, unintended impacts of exposure to these pesticides can have impacts on, on bees and other pollinators, and uh, something we've worked on quite extensively in my lab. Um, so thinking about how we can reduce and, and refine our use of pesticides uh, and think about which types of pesticides we're using so that we try and use the ones that are, are less harmful to uh, insect pollinators and other beneficial insects when they come into contact with them, uh, even when that's an unintended uh, exposure. Next slide, please. And we can see that also there are other practices like uh, mowing, which might be really important for pollinators, because if we're removing uh, vegetation, we may be removing key flowers at key times of the year. And so thinking about mowing schedules and mowing practices could be another way in which uh, farms could in enhance their uh, friendliness to pollinators. Next slide, please. So we've talked, uh, I mentioned creating and restoring habitat, and, and clearly here's some examples from, from southern Ontario. Um, on, the, on the top right, we can see here a pollinator hedge at the YU Ranch, Brian Gilvesi's ranch, um, and they can be really, really good because they can provide these kind of perennial hedgerows can provide early season forage for uh, early emerging bees and queen bumblebees, for example, and some early emerging solitary bees because they're they're, they're established plantings, they're established trees that may be flowering early. Uh, they, they can be really, really helpful for those early season pollinators where not, not, much other, not many other flowers are around. We can see on the, the bottom left, uh, an example of tall grass prairie, tall, a tall grass prairie planting. Um, we have lost uh, about 97% of the tall grass prairie in Ontario, so we're at about 3% of what there was originally there. Uh, and this we know is an important habitat. Uh, it supports many rare and endangered species of, of, of birds and also of insects. In fact, uh, one, of my, one of my students, uh, Janine Sharkey, was working at Ojibwe um, Prairie down uh, near Windsor and uh, discovered a new bee species record for Canada in such a, a habitat and probably has found another couple of records that may be new for Ontario as well. We can also look at sort of intercropping plantings like we can see here at M&R orchards between the rows of the apple trees, these kind of set aside areas where perennial plantings can be managed, they're, they're mowed around so that the vehicles can still get in and out of the rows to, uh, to, to do the, the maintenance on the crop itself. And there may be, there, there's some evidence, as I'll point out to you in, in, in some of the slides to come, that they may also be valuable sources of pollinators for the crops themselves. Um, and we can also look at plantings that support a lot of insect biodiversity uh, around wetlands, whether they're existing wetlands like rivers or creeks, or whether they're water reservoirs that have been dug on, on the property, as this one was here at the MNR orchards as well. And when we're thinking about pollinators, we're not just thinking about how we can support pollination services, we're also thinking about how we can support other ecosystem goods and services. So we may also be benefiting other insects that, that provide an, uh, a pest control uh, function for farmers and other wildlife. And with things like the water um, waterside plantings, also we can see that that might be affecting soil erosion, that might also be uh, filtering out some of the uh, agrochemicals that are being used on the farm and preventing them from going into watercourses. Next slide, please. Um, we, it's a key question of where we put some of these plantings. In some cases, it's relatively obvious where those areas are, and clearly we're not 
advocating that farmers should take prime uh, prime real estate, prime crop producing land out of production uh, to put these kind of habitats in. But uh, some work that was done by my colleagues at the University of Guelph, led by Virginia Campbell Terrace here, uh, actually was looking at how precision agriculture can inform these things. So we have clearly very good data on uh, inputs that are being put into uh, into the into the farms and at, diff at very small spatial scales and yield maps that are coming out. So from these, uh, she and her colleagues produced these profitability maps, and we can see that there are areas where uh, of strong red consistently in these in this example of a farm field where this is this is losing the farmer money because the costs of the inputs are higher than the the the, the yield that's coming in uh, in terms of that so so those areas might be key areas where other um, beneficial things could be done so uh, a, a, a restoration planting to provide alternative uh, ecological goods and services including uh, habitat for pollinators might be a key thing next slide please and we looked at tall grass prairie. Here's an example again from some colleagues at the University of Guelph, led by uh, Alexandra Dolezal, um, looking at how the abundance, the number of insects and the types of insects, the number of species that are found, the species richness in different habitats, both in the crop fields, the crop adjacent restored areas of tall grass prairie and forest fragments on the same farms. And she clearly found, as you can see um, in her studies at both, in both El in Elgin and Norfolk County, that um, there was a, a significant bump in the numbers and also the diversity, the richness, the number of species of pollinators that she found in this prairie adjacent to the crops. And these, this, this uh, abundance change and this richness change happened relatively quickly after these were established. So this doesn't need to be a very long term project, although these prairies can last for a very long time being uh, with re relatively little management as well once they're established and many of the farmers that that have put them in uh, like them very much because they're they're a really um, a really nice feature on the farm um, I alluded next slide please um, I alluded earlier to the fact that the pollinators can clearly can actually be beneficial as well to the farmers depending on the crops that are being grown Clearly, if you have an insect dependent crop like a fruit crop or a vegetable crop, uh, you may need pollinators to set seed or to increase the yield of that crop. And that's certainly true for blueberries. This is an example uh, of, uh, of a, uh, establishing pollinator habitat adjacent to blueberry fields in Michigan done by Brett Blau and Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State. Uh, and as you can see here, we have on the left side of the graph the percentage change in yield. And so that's the blue bars. And um, on the right is the uh, is the cumulative profit over over four years after establishing a two acre wildflower planting adjacent to a 10 acre blueberry field. And what they found in the in years two, three and four, that there was an increase in yield as a result of um, uh, as a result of more hoverflies and more native bees uh, foraging in the blueberry crop crop as they were supported by this uh, crop adjacent planting and that the initial cost that you can see um, in year one the cost of establishing this habitat uh, were offset over a four year four year period so into years five six and seven uh, there was actually a profit to be made from actually taking this area out of production and putting it into uh, an alternative planting next slide please We've talked a lot about perennial uh, plantings, so tall grass prairie or hedgerows or these intercropping areas or, or even these specific uh, plantings uh, at the site of crops. Um, uh, annual plantings can also be really important. Here's some work from a, a current MSc student, uh, Kristen uh, Radcliffe, who has been work looking at different types of, uh, of cover cropping. Uh, planting in, in June, July, and I haven't shown the data for August because they were less successful. Um, and and the, these bars show the, the, the flowering period of different species that have been put in as cover crops. So buckwheat, borage, uh, dwarf sunflowers, phasalia and crimson clover. Now the crimson clover was a bit of a flop, which is a shame because that's really good for bumblebees, but we saw a lot of um, a lot of activity on all of these crops which were picked because they are attractive to a number of wild bees we saw plenty of helianthus uh, uh, plenty of uh, bees on the on the sunflowers 
uh, and all of the other different groups. So there were there were plenty of melasodes, which are the sunflower bees, um, and bumblebees and honeybees. So this was a, a widely uh, productive uh, system and uh, could be could be introduced on a rotating field basis as well. So uh, quite a quite a nice result there from Kirsten's work. So next slide, please. Uh, another thing that we've been working on is is how to actually help farmers to choose what they're going to use to establish these uh, crop, uh, these plantings on their farms when they've determined where that might be good places to restore or to create habitat they need to decide which flowers and which uh, trees or or plants to to put in so there's a link here at the bottom to this decision tool that uh, Susan Chan, a former PhD student of mine, uh, worked on uh, and is, is hosted on the Farms at Work website. And it's something you can play around with yourself if you go to that um, uh, go to that link. Next slide, please. You can see that we get the phenology, the time of the flowering of each of these species. So the species are down the left, uh, and so you can build a community of plants in your mix such that you have flowering from early season in April all the way through until uh, late September or even early October so that you're supporting different types of pollinators throughout the season which is really important. You can obviously plug in the different types of uh, soil moisture or plant type that you're looking for whether that's annual perennial or whether that's a tree time uh, a sort of tree that you want to plant. Next slide please. And you can see you can set all of these different decision criteria, which really help uh, you, uh, whether you're looking at native uh, species or non-native or specifically Carolinian species for southern Ontario um, and what other value they might have for you as well. So whether they, they have a crop value or a cover crop value uh, and may provide other ecosystem goods and services on the farm. Next slide, please. We've talked a lot about flowers and flowers are clearly important for pollinators, particularly things like bees that rely on um, flowers for the pollen and nectar requirements. They're, they're fully reliant on those, but they also need nesting sites. And most of the bees that we know about, we have about 420 species in Ontario, close to 900 species now in, in Canada. Uh, about 70% of those are, are ground nesting solitary bees. So you see these small holes in the ground on the sandy uh, soil and on the left hand side. Uh, they may well be uh, bee holes if they're very regular and, and sort of regularly spaced like this. And so we have a, a number of uh, uh, ground nesting bees. So having areas of, of clear, well-drained soil may be very important for those ground nesting bees. Next slide, please. There are a lot of uh, cavity nesting bees that nest in uh, pithy stems or decaying wood. So old wood and snags and uh, areas of brush are important for those uh, for those cavity nesting bees. Probably the next most species group, the next most species group of bees. Next slide, please. And so and sort of uh, more untidy areas, uh, piles of brush or tusky grass uh, or even big piles of leaves may be very important uh, over wintering sites for a number of pollinators. Uh, leaves can be very important for a, a number of our, our butterfly species and uh, bumblebees and, and the like can use some of these um, uh, these brush piles and dig into the soil beneath them. Next slide, please. We also need to, to think of when we're providing these uh, plants of, of not just the nectar sources provided by them and the pollen sources, but also the, the larval food sources and a key, key uh, an example that I'm sure you're all familiar with is milkweeds and the link with the uh, with monarch butterflies. Um, you can see here an adult feeding on the flowers of milkweed uh, and other pollinators use that use it as a, a nectar source as well, like uh, honeybees and, and solitary bees and bumblebees. But clearly, there's also a very important role to be played that the females lay the eggs on these plants and the, the, the caterpillars develop on those. So it's not just about a food resource, although that, and that's, that's certainly important uh, from, from other species later in the season to prepare these butterflies for migration. But for the juveniles, for the larvae, we, we need to have milkweed at a particular time. And in southern Ontario, that's quite important for that population. Next slide, please. 
So we think a lot about how pollinators are declining and we haven't necessarily got the best handle on that for Ontario at this point. Uh, some of the work we're doing in the in the lab is to try and assess the, the diversity and uh, health of pollinator populations in, in Ontario and we're, that's an ongoing project. Um, the uh, provincial government in 2016 launched a pollinator health action plan uh, and in it they had a goal to restore, enhance and protect uh, one million acres of pollinator habitat in southern Ontario. So we, when, when this came out, we were really interested because that sounded like a, a huge amount of habitat and uh, we wanted to assess whether that was going to be uh, uh, enough, too much, about right. Uh, and we calculated that it represents about four and a half percent of the land in southern Ontario, the Mixwood Plain Ecozone. And that's where most of the farmland is that we find in, in Ontario. Um, so uh, Alana Pindar, a former postdoc of mine, has spent a long time gathering up data from, from wild pollinator surveys, wild bee surveys, uh, collected over the last 15 to 20 years. And she amassed a, uh, up to 63,000 records of bees across Ontario and looked at the uh, over 360 species. Uh, and assessed the types of habitats that they were found in and the relative uh, abundance of the different habitats at different spatial scales within those landscapes. And when we've, when we've done all the analysis, we come to the conclusion that actually when we look at the different types of bees, the cavity nesting bees, the ground nesting bees, the bumblebees, uh, the parasitic bees, uh, we come to the conclusion that actually we need somewhere around 11.6 to 16.7% land cover in a diverse range of habitats um, to support the types of wild bee communities that we're seeing in those surveys. Now, we don't know if those uh, are necessarily particularly healthy communities, but we're using that as a baseline. Um, so it suggests that actually we need substantially more than the 1 million acres that was outlined in the Pollinator Health Action Plan in 2016. And interestingly, we found that sensitive and declining habitats like tall grass woodlands and wetlands were important predictors of, of bee biodiversity. So there were some species that were found in those habitats that were not found in other areas. And we're in the process of trying to publish that, that, that work at the moment. And uh, I will be excited to talk in more detail about that uh, with anyone who's interested um, as soon as that comes out. So um, this is a key thing the way farmers can help because clearly we can't just say, okay, uh, we hive off six, even 16% of the land and say, okay, that's protected land in Northern Ontario because that's not gonna work. Pollinators don't operate at a provincial scale, they operate at a local scale. Some of the, some of the, the, the bees may only travel tens or hundreds of meters from their nesting site. So we need to provide nesting and uh, uh, floral resources within a, a very local uh, purview. So on a farm scale or within farm scales. So having, um, a, a, a patchwork a, a, of these different habitats across the landscape and connecting those together is really, really important from a pollinator perspective. So we've talked a lot about uh, floral resources and nesting resources and, and different habitats, and that's very important. Um, here's a, a little cartoon that sort of outlines the different modes of, of pesticide application and possible routes of exposure to wild bees. Here we're using bumblebees in this example. You can see on the left side when we're planting treated seed, there may be dust coming off those, although that has been mitigated to some extent with different with different uh, products on the the drills and, and fluency agents, et cetera. Uh, uh, but some of those pesticides going into, into the soil and, and the potential for exposure in the soil and uh, them being taken up by uh, wildflowers and crops that the bees may feed on. Um, so there are different routes of exposure. And, and also later in the season, as you can see on the right, there are spray applications to these crops, which may happen uh, and cause contact exposure, uh, depending on the timing of that, or there may be some drift onto uh, crop adjacent uh, flowers that the bees or other pollinators might be using. So thinking about those multiple routes of possible exposure, uh, most of the risk assessments that have been done to date have really focused on honeybees, which while they're very interesting, are, are, are essentially a managed pollinator, a farm animal, if you like, uh, and they, their life history and their ecology is very different to most of the wild, most of the bees that we have in Canada. Um, most bees don't live in big colonies that overwinter as colonies and produce honey, 
and fly relatively large distances to find their food. Actually, uh, with the exception of bumblebees, they're solitary bees, and uh, many of them, as I said earlier, nest in the ground, some in um, cavities in, in wood, etc., that they make. So there may be different routes of exposure. So thinking about how and where we can reduce pesticide exposure um, and think about alternative methods of control. And if we are having to use pesticides to control uh, uh, crop pests, that, that we're using the ones that are that, that balance the effectiveness of pest, pest control against the possible unintended consequences of exposure to these beneficial uh, insects that uh, farmers also rely on. It's obviously a very hard balance to achieve. Next slide, please. Um, we talked a little bit uh, in, the, in the original cartoon about mowing, uh, and there's, there's a number of good studies now that have looked at mowing frequency and, and concluded that uh, actually reducing the frequency of mowing or the extent of mowing uh, can increase both pollinator uh, abundance and richness. And, and that's not really surprising when we, when we consider the, the number of plants that may be flowering in these areas on the sides of roads or at the sides of fields uh, or, or even or domestic or, or commercial lawns. So uh, thinking about when, when and how frequently we mow, and there may be key times in the year when mowing might be avoided, like early season, we talked about uh, pollinator hedgerows being good for early season. Um, lawns can be really good. Some of the early flowering uh, annuals that come up can be good, uh, good nectar and pollen sources for those early season andrina bees and bumblebees that are out. Uh, and potentially there's also uh, benefits to the farmer in terms of uh, reducing the workload. So that's fewer times to go, have to go out and do the mowing or pay for someone to go and do the mowing and therefore a re reduction in the costs associated with that. So um, even, if, even if it's just removing one mowing cycle per year, um, that might be, a, a, that might be a, an improvement in terms of the, the pollinator's view of the habitat. Next slide, please. So we talked uh, a lot about the different types of ways in which we can uh, support pollinators, and clearly they're one good example of uh, how uh, nature can provide ecological goods and services free, the pollination services they provide to crops and to, to wild plants free of charge if they're present in the landscape and we support them. But this idea of stacking ecosystem services and, and putting in habitats that will also uh, help with uh, ameliorating issues around pest control, so having other beneficial insects. They, they may help with soil erosion when we think about things like cover crops, putting those in, um, and these plantings between farm fields and watercourses to, uh, to maintain water quality, to, to, to try and um, suck up and buffer any of the agrochemicals, fertilizers, and other things that might be going in um, to the watercourses that would be uh, absorbed by these plantings and also have the benefits to uh, beneficial insects uh, like pollinators. Um, we, uh, uh, myself and colleagues, have, have written this uh, Ecological Goods and Services Spotlight Report, um, which is free to download from the Aral Food Institute's um, uh, website, as you can see from this link. And if, you, if you're interested, I, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to go away and read that. Um, Thank you for your attention. If I have time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nigel, for that awesome presentation. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to say those photos that you showed at the beginning uh, of your slides uh, about product choices with and without bees were quite startling. Um, and it's clear to see why practices supporting pollinators and their services is so important for agriculture, uh, biodiversity, and, and ultimately the world. Um, we did have a couple questions come in and I know that uh, you have other engagements. So um, I'm happy to pose those questions to you. Um, okay. So the first one that we had come in uh, is from Martin and Martin asks, how can these new habitats be created carefully to avoid ecosystem disservices such as new pests and diseases? That's that's a great question uh, 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 and something we have to be very mindful of when we're when we're planting and, and making planting plans. Um, so uh, preparing the site 
very carefully when we're restoring or creating those habitats and making sure that uh, the seed bank that, that will have uh, weeds and other um, non-preferred plants in there is very important. Uh, and there are different ways of doing that, either through solarization or through use of herbicides in some, some instances to, to prepare the site. And every time I'm, I'm talking to people about putting these in, the site preparation is really, really key. Uh, and thinking about the the plants that we're using and making sure that we we're where possible we're using native uh native plants and, and locally sourced seed and i know that's also an issue in terms of how how much of that you can access and, and often the costs of that can be quite high so uh that's another challenge that we have when we're trying to create those kind of um those kind of plantings and habitats uh, um in, in terms of the other aspect, which was about um, disease, um, clearly there are some, some issues around uh, pathogen uh, spillover and spillback from managed pollinators, uh, primarily from, uh, from managed uh, honeybees and also in some cases around glass houses, around uh, commercially produced bumblebees. Uh, where some pathogens that they have can spill over to the wild bees through shared use of flowers, uh, and I think really what we can what we can think about there is about um, improving beekeeping practices. And I know there's a there's a lot of work going on through the OBA and other regional um, uh, associations to improve the quality of of beekeeping and beekeeping training, uh, and also to to uh, be very mindful of the the hive density around uh around areas where uh, wild pollinators are also active and trying not to increase their levels of competition too too greatly so that there's there's a chance for the the wild pollinators to also succeed um alongside those those managed honeybees awesome thanks nigel martin i hope that uh, answers your question um, another question from Leslie. Um, do you feel that the decision tool could be used for peri-urban and urban restoration work? Yeah, I think I think it could absolutely. Um, the focus was on was for farms uh, and some of the types of um, some of the types of flower uh, plant choice may not be ideal for urban and peri-urban work, but I think you could certainly use the, the phenology aspect to create communities of plants and and plant them. So yes, I, I think it, it, it definitely would work for that. So thank you for that question. That's a really good good point. Great. Thanks, Nigel. Um, I think we're running a little behind time. So if any other questions come in for, for you, I'll, I'm happy to share them after this session and, and see if we can get them answered for audience members. Um, thank you again for joining us today. I know you had to rearrange your schedule to fit us in. And, and, and thanks for bearing with us uh, through our technical difficulties. No, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Great. Thanks. So after that, I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, Mike Buttonham. Mike is the Sustainability and Environment Lead for the Grain Farmers of Ontario. Within his role as Sustainability and Environment Lead, Mike leads the development of Grain Farmers of Ontario sustainability initiatives and works with supply chain partners to, de to develop win-win solutions for sustainable agriculture requirements. He actively participates in industry working groups related to environment, sustainability, and the management of nutrients to advance sustainability and environment efforts on farm. Mike will be speaking to us today to, on uh, sustainable market drivers. What does it mean for biodiversity on the farm? Whenever you're ready, Mike, take it away. Thanks, Danny. Uh, it's great to be here and to speak uh, to the Ontario Biodiversity Council. So uh, thanks again for the invitation. So today, as uh, Danny had mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the sustainability market drivers that we're seeing from an Ontario perspective, but also internationally. And it takes a little bit of a different lens from the past presentations, but I think it all ties in very nicely. Um, so to start things off, um, just to share a little bit more about who we are, um, Grain Farmers of Ontario is the uh, largest commodity organization here in the province. We represent 28,000 farmers who grow barley, corn, oats, soybeans, and wheat. And this covers uh, around 6 million acres or 2.5 million hectares. So that's just to, to set the stage a little bit about who Grain Farmers of Ontario are. 
But what I want to share with you today is a little bit more about some of these market demands that we've been seeing. And some of these headlines um, are some of the risks around the world that we're seeing with sustainability. Uh, we know that uh, globally there's crops that are, are sourced from a variety of regions. Uh, some of these regions are experiencing different issues than maybe we are in Canada or sometimes maybe they are the same. Uh, whether it be deforestation or child labor or all those sorts of things. Uh, these are main sustainability risks that the marketplace is seeing. Um, and some of these that um, I want to share, I guess, um, oh, what's going on here? Slides advancing. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure why those jumped ahead. But um, just to highlight the sustainability risks that we're seeing, you know, deforestation, these that are sourcing from regions in, in higher risk areas are really taking notice of some of the. Now, one step further, um, sustainability market demands we're seeing from companies that purchase local grains and oil seeds here in Ontario. Uh, three examples that I, I threw up on the slide. Uh, you know, these companies are purchasing products that are grown here, processed here, and using in their uh, end uses uh, that reach the consumer shelf or storefronts. Um, we know that consumer packaged good companies are really placing an added emphasis on things like climate change. Um, they're also putting emphasis on learning more about where the products they're sourcing are coming from and the story behind that. We've seen um, ESG be such a, a large component in corporate social responsibility of, of large companies. Um, so there are market demands out there for the products that we're producing. And to take that one step further, um, there are groups that are uh, focusing and coalitions that are focusing on specifically biodiversity within the food sector. Uh, these are making it within their, their mandate and their corporate social responsibility plans to really look at biodiversity. In their supply chains and age as to sustainability um, market drivers and really the key um, you know, demands that we're seeing from that grain level um, on the farm so what does this exactly mean um, so what we're seeing is companies within the food and drink sector are really looking for greater transparency of the of the products that they're sourcing um, you know, farmers are being asked to potentially go through some form of tool or scheme to really verify the practices that they do on the land are sustainable. Um, so there's this added level of proof that some of these companies are being uh, are asking of producers to ensure that the products that they're sourcing don't come from deforested lands um, that don't employ child labor and these sorts of uh, higher risk uh, themes. So oh, the complexity of this, and I just wanted to highlight quickly, is there's many different sustainability schemes around the world, all um, for different markets, for different crops, that really create a bit of a complexity. Kind of tie it all together. So what does this mean for biodiversity? Some of these different sustainability uh, programs or, or, or uh, schemes, they really ask farmers about and what does biodiversity mean on the farm? I think ultimately the goal that we see within this space is, you know, how do we ensure that we're still able to produce a quality quantity product um, to meet this ever-growing population while st still ensuring that there is ample habitat for biodiversity? Um, we know though that companies are really trying to look at biodiversity and sustainability on a very global lens. When you have companies like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, um, you know, they're looking at sustainability and biodiversity from a global perspective. And this is uh, challenging in some situations because, um, you know, there are local uh, laws and there's local uh, area practices that maybe don't necessarily conform to what some of these higher risk uh, nations are seeing in comparison. So I think, you know, for, for us as, as grain farmers, I think Biodiversity definitely is, is something that uh, is, is quite important, but 
when you're looking at it through it, the sustainability lens of what corporate um, packaged good companies or food companies look at it, it's, it's quite different around the world. Um, and I think one thing that's really been, been uh, noticeable through this kind of transition that we're seeing with sustainable agriculture is, is some farmers, when asked about biodiversity, you know, don't really necessarily realize um, that they're they're doing it, and I think that's that's a key thing that I've seen through this this process. Um, farmers think, well, I, I don't have a plan on biodiversity, um, but when you break it down to the basics, and I think Mark really said it well off the start, is looking at crop rotations and certain things that that we're doing um, to a farmer that that may not be you know fully in the know on biodiversity. Um, he may say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. But when you break it down to some of the practices and, and you know, whether they're doing rotational grazing or, or other aspects, you know, there's a lot of different things that work towards developing biodiversity from a, a microbe, invertebrate, fungi. And it really exists um, you know, from the woodlot that's on the back of the farm to the wetland to the field soils and really everything in between. So. I think that's something that's really been important in uh, in my line of work is is really trying to highlight some of what we're doing today that that's great and ultimately re realizing that there is still work needed ahead but to really celebrate that there is a lot of great work uh, going on and I think we've seen that today through the work of the EFP and through uh, Mike and his uh, operation as well. Um, I think also kind of a, a takeaway for myself with this is is working with farmers. It's really there isn't a one size fits all approach to biodiversity on the farm. And I think depending on where you are and your soil type and your crop rotation and, and whether you have livestock or whether you don't, there is a different approach to meeting biodiversity. And I think it's really important to kind of recognize that, that there isn't just a, a, a cookie cutter approach that everyone will follow. It really is, is site specific um, and, and it lends to individual operations. So with that, uh, I just wanted to highlight um, a, a grower, a grain farmer living in Perth County and, uh, you know, to try to highlight the wind winds that we're seeing. And I think I mentioned that, you know, sometimes farmers don't necessarily always think about biodiversity. Um, and it's not to say that they're not thinking about it, but it's not the primary objective. You know, the primary objective is to grow a crop, um, a healthy, profitable crop that really focuses on the themes of sustainability, environment, social, and, and uh, economic. And uh, I wanted to highlight this farm in Perth County. Um, so Steve and Gail Yahtzee, they had lived on this property since the early 1980s. It was their home farm. And it was a, a great piece of land in, in speaking with uh, Steve and Gail. And, and I think they uh, experienced a few challenges though over the years. Um, part of the field there was a three acre section of the field that was constantly wet and it really presented them with challenges getting into the field in the spring getting the crop off in the fall was just really problematic and it really came down to being kind of a, a problematic piece um, so they tried a few things they tried doing some tile drainage they tried doing a few um, type of tillage uh, practices and ultimately nothing had worked so they were fortunate to get in touch with someone from Ducks Unlimited and this was ultimately the end goal was um, per putting in a, a wetland and as a result there's a three acre wetland on the east side of their farm. It was something that um, they've seen great benefit from. They've now been able to take that three acres that provided them with a lot of difficulty um, and plant native species. Um, they've been seeing all sorts of, of wildlife and ultimately it's made their farm more profitable. They've been able to uh, work the ground all at the same time and harvest all at the same time. Um, you know, taking that three acres out of production made sense for their operation. So I think, you know, this is kind of a take home message for myself in speaking with some of these, these farmers that have participated in best management practices through, you know, whether it be Ducks Unlimited or I think we'll hear next from Alice, but it's, you know, how do we create these win-win scenarios that when we do the right thing and planting native species, um, you know, we can have a, an economic benefit to the farm, but also have that environmental uh, benefit and, and really provide an increase in biodiversity and habitat. So this is a really neat project. And I think it's, it's great to see farmers that are willing to try uh, new, new ideas and new approaches to really 
um, you know, ultimately um, you know, improve uh, the, the pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. So just in closing, uh, you know, companies are increasingly wanting to share the good work they're doing with farmers and supply chains to protect biodiversity. Um, we know there's best management practices out there, uh, and I think they have a great ability to provide these win-win scenarios in, in the case of Steve and his wife, Gail, in helping to improve for farm efficiencies. Um, I think the reality is in Ontario, we have multiple diverse habitats. Um, and I think farmers ultimately though are committed to uh, working in, and coexisting uh, with habitats and, and having agriculture and habitats work together. Um, I, I think you know, looking at the full ecosystem and the landscape is, is really important to ensure that it meets the needs of everyone. And I think that's that's the key message here today. So again, I appreciate the time uh, to speak today and uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike, for your presentation. Um, it's easy to see the importance of ensuring we're producing quality ag products uh, to meet a uh, growing population, um, but still ensuring efficient habitat for uh, biodiversity. So thanks for that. Um, I think we're running a little bit behind on time. Um, so I'm gonna save some questions to the end and ask them if, if we're not running over. Um, but if I don't get the chance, I'll share those questions with you uh, and have them answered for the audience after the session. But thanks again for your presentation and uh, I'll share some questions with you at the end if we have time. So last but certainly not least is our next panelist, Laura Ellis. Laura is Senior Vice President of Policy and Partnerships of ALICE. She's eager to scale the conservation work of ALICE Canada by finding effective ways to strengthen environmental protection and grow community sustainability and resilience. Laura is focused on the development of new regulated and unregulated ecosystem service markets and growing support for natural infrastructure on agricultural lands. Laura is pleased to be a member of the Women for Nature Network, which links 150 influential Canadian women to leverage efforts to save wildlife and protect nature. Her contribution to developing innovative environmental solutions was recognized with a Clean 50 Award in 2017. Prior to her work at ALICE, Laura worked at the Ivy Foundation, Nature Canada, and CPAW's Wildlands League promoting forest conservation protected areas, and sustainable resource use. She has two degrees from McGill University, a BA in English Literature, and a Master's of Management McGill McConnell program. She's based in Toronto, Canada. Lara will be speaking to us today on enabling community-developed and farmer-led biodiversity restoration. The floor is yours, Lara. Thank you. Um, I go super fast, so I'm good to have last on the panel. Um, Anyway, I'm going to just see if I can, and I can't advance the slides, which is going to be, uh, Danny or, or Mike, can you, um, okay, did I just tell you? I'll just tell you, I know we're, we're behind time here, so, okay, Alice, so um, I'm hoping that the people who are uh, part of farm communities know Alice. Um, ALICE stands for Alternative Land Use Services, meaning using agricultural land for something other than agriculture. Um, we are a charitable organization established in 2015 after um, many years um, operating under another NGO, uh, Delta Waterfowl. ALICE was developed by farmers um, and all of our community programs and our national organization are, are um, are led by farmers. Um, next slide. Um, oh, I think we can go to the one after that. Okay, sorry, the, the uh, oh, back, back again. So Alice's mission is to generate uh, ecological goods and services on farmland. Um, we support farmers and ranchers and communities in terms of offering programmatic and financial assistance to do projects that restore nature on farmland and ranch land. Um, you know, we rely on, on people um, outside of the norm 
um, as as Mark uh, uh, you know mentioned uh, in, in in his in his opening remarks, uh, people like the first farmer who presented, Mike Mike Swiderski, those are the sort of uh, people that we hope to engage in leadership roles in Alice um, in terms of helping to find local programming um, and, and, and the services that we offer to, to farmers and ranchers who are interested in doing the sorts of uh, progressive work that we saw Mike present on this morning. Um, next slide. Um, so we are science-based. We heard from, from Nigel and others about uh, the exciting work that, that uh, links biodiversity to biodiversity restoration projects to better outcomes for biodiversity, but also better outcomes in terms of sustainable agriculture. So we continually refine and improve our advice and services that we offer to farmers and ranchers and ranchers about how to maximize biodiversity impacts in the sorts of projects that they are being, um, that are being developed and enrolled in the ALICE program. So, you know, our approach is very grassroots in this. Um, as I mentioned, we're a community developed and farmer de developed, farmer delivered. Um, we take the enthusiasm and hard work of our farmers and ranchers and couple it with with the science and, and the best people that aren't that can that can contribute to that. Um, next slide. So we are building bridges. Um, Nigel Rains was, was the first recipient of our Ecosystem Innovation Award, um, which is uh, supported by the Weston Foundation. So we, we, we link researchers that are doing biodiversity work with our farmers and researchers and make sure that there is a, a trusting relationship built over time. Um, and then the information that we get from the researchers is then put back into our program design um, and, and management of our programs, which is um, helping us become more efficient with our resources over time. Um, our methods are tested. So, you know, we are seeing that uh, the, the, the program is continuously growing. We're now in 31 uh, communities across the country. Um, and, and farm, we have we have a lot of uh, enthusiasm from farmers who want to participate. Um, the only thing that's stopping us from growing even more is uh, is financial resources. Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned, we are in I think we're in 31 communities now. We'll be growing, putting some new community programming uh, in this year. Um, we generally grow by a few communities every year. Um, we're really big in Alberta um, and Ontario newer to Quebec. Um, of course, Prince Edward Island has an ALICE program that's uh, run by the provincial government. We now are offering additional support for new sorts of specific programming, uh, particularly around species at risk um, on, on the island. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of mainstreaming biodiversity, uh, ALICE is working with farmers and ranchers across Ontario, across Canada. Um, to put wetlands back. So we do wetland restoration work, um, creation, um, and, and a whole load of uh, wetland enhancement work. Next slide. Grassland projects um, are particularly, um, well, they're important actually in all of our communities across the country, but in southwestern Ontario, where Alice really got its feet um, and, and started its momentous growth over the past uh, six years is where we sort of piloted uh, native prairie restoration and have become, um, I think, experts in, 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 how to, uh, in how to see that these grassland projects get uh, started and, and succeed. Next, next slide. Um, we also do a lot of afforestation. Um, you know, not not just rows of trees for for wood production, but actually trying to create some healthy habitat for biodiversity. Um, also contributing to natural infrastructure and those sorts of things. So you know, we do eco buffers, we do very diverse uh, hedgerows, uh, shelter, shelter belts, that sort of thing. Um, and and that's a that's a huge uh, contributor to sustainable agriculture as well as biodiversity improvement seeing as there's the whole 
you know, the, the whole um, attributes around water retention, soil protection, and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. And riparian buffer. So this is the same area. I was once accused of showing slides of a different area because they said, how could the spot on the right actually be the spot on the left? That's over about eight years, and it's a case study that we had on our website. I'm not sure if we still do, but um, there's a lot of uh, care and uh, attention paid to, to making a riparian buffer like that. And so, of course, Alice helps farmers get these uh, sites established and then manage them, which is a very important part of how our program works. So the farmers um, receive support on an annual basis according to the management that they that they do for, for the Alice projects. Um, next slide. So why do farmers enroll in Alice? You know, just we have over 1,100 farmers now in, in the program, many of whom are in, in southwestern Ontario where we have really good land coverage. Um, a lot of them enroll because of wildlife. So you talk to the farmers and the ranchers and they say, we used to see this on our land and we don't see that anymore. Um, they're interested in legacy. What sort of uh, land are they leaving to their, to their children and their children's children? Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a reason why a lot of farmers um, enroll in the program. Um, and you know, just like Nigel was talking about uh, in terms of, of the results of, of uh, restoration projects, they see a lot of things happening pretty quickly once these, pro once these projects are put in the ground. So on this slide here, you have uh, Mark Bercier, who's a farmer in Eastern Ontario. Um, very innovative entrepreneurial guy. He won, he actually won a pollinator partnership award a few years ago. And uh, this year he won our, our, our uh, producer innovation award. So, you know, we know anecdotally about what, what they're experiencing, what they're seeing on their, on their farm. And uh, the, the biodiversity impacts are, are right at the top of that list. Um, next slide. So, you know, we work, oh, the title, anyway, sorry, my, my, my slides aren't uh, particularly good with the title being cut off there. Anyway, we do work with a lot of researchers. Um, we, we facilitate access to our farmers, um, sort of monitor the relationships, make sure that uh, everybody's happy on both sides. And the quantification of the biodiversity impacts of our projects are, are very important. As I mentioned, we have lots of anecdotal evidence from our participants, but in terms of accessing some of the, the markets that uh, Mike was talking about, we act, pe people want more than just anecdotal evidence. So the more that we can prove that our work is having an impact, the more dollars come in um, to help us expand and support the farmers that we're working with um, at this time. Next slide. So I probably should, should have used a picture of Nigel here because he won our first uh, ecosystem innovation award uh, quite a few years ago. But we do we do champion um, the work of the researchers in this area that are working with Alice uh, as an organization and and doing research on our participants. Um, and and as I mentioned before, the biodiversity information that we get from researchers is then put back into helping our, our projects be more and more efficient. So it's a really great, uh, you know, I know we know the researchers appreciate um, the, the, the role that Alice plays in, in fostering these relationships and we certainly appreciate the quantification and all of the information that we get from the researchers about how we can even maximize uh, biodiversity impacts more than we are right now. Um, next slide. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm finishing here. I did not include, uh, we have lots of information for farmers and ranchers. I was going to do a slide, but I didn't just showing the, the variety of tools that we have for farmers and ranchers on how they can, um, increase biodiversity impacts, uh, from in different ways on their farm. So that's all available on our website. Um, so I hope people will check it out and if they know farmers or if they are farmers or if they know farmers that are interested in working with Alice that they certainly get in touch with us. Um, we're not everywhere yet um, but we do sort of keep an eye on areas where there is a lot of interest 
um, so that we can, when we do have more money to grow, that uh, those areas are, are higher on the list. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Amazing. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I just want to say I can't believe the difference in, in that uh, riparian buffer you showed over such a short period of time. Like like you said, it doesn't even look like the, the same piece of land. So that was wonderful to see. I think, and I think it was yeah. Yeah, I can't believe that. Um, and it's great to see how Alice is playing a, a critical role in enabling a community developed and, and farmer led uh, biodiversity restoration. So thank you again for your presentation. So unfortunately, we're running a little uh, behind time. So uh, and one of our panelists unfortunately had to step off. Um, so I'm going to uh, send the the remainder of the questions that we have to our individual panelists and and see if we can get some answers for for our audience members after the session is done. So we'll make sure that we can get those out to you. Um, but in the interest of time, I just wanted to say what wonderful presentations from all of our panelists. Uh, again. And a huge thank you to everyone who took the time to speak today and take the time out of their, what I know is very busy schedules. Um, there was so much good information and I hope they've given you all some food for thought. But before we go, I just want to close the session with a couple thoughts on our session theme. So from the food we eat to the products we buy, agriculture plays a fundamental role in everyone's life. Um, it provides the food we eat, raw materials for goods such as clothing, shelter, and fuel. And it provides incomes and livelihoods for many individuals and families. But at the basis and core of it all is the biodiversity. Maintaining this biodiversity on farm is of critical importance. So like Mark mentioned, crops, plants, livestock, insects, water systems, soils, natural landscapes, they all interact with and they depend on each other. Agroecosystems depend on diversity to stay in balance. And if that balance of these factors is carefully maintained, they function together to the benefit of agriculture and ultimately the world. If the balance isn't maintained, it threatens the integrity and sustainability of our agricultural industry. So maintaining agricultural productivity and sustainability depends on and ultimately benefits from preserving and protecting biodiversity. Agriculture can contribute to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, but if we're not careful, it can also cause major losses, as Mark mentioned in his opening. Many modern practices to meet growing demands for food, fiber, and fuel has sadly caused a reduction in this diversity, and the resulting loss can have significant consequences for all ecosystems and species on Earth. As stewards of the land, farmers and their farms have a critical role to play in maintain maintaining healthy agricultural ecosystems and improving biodiversity. Farmers have long depended on nature and the land for their livelihood, and they have the opportunity to make great contributions without necessarily making major changes to their practices. Even small changes can have huge improvements. Each farm is unique. There is not a one-size-fits-all approach. But implementing practices like using livestock to graze crops and control weeds, maintaining grassland, participating in the EFP program, using pollinator-friendly practices such as minimizing mowing of roadsides and marginal lands and lawns. All these practices can make a big difference. Using nutrients, water, space, and energy more efficiently, using more effective measures for soil and water conservation, and using biological resources better to raise and maintain yields of crops and livestock are all really good investments to preserving diversity within our agricultural ecosystem. Without biodiversity, we have no food or environmental security. So managing agricultural systems and their associated landscapes in a sustainable manner that preserves and promotes biodiversity will produce lasting economic and social benefits and will ensure future generations have access to these important resources. So thank you everyone for tuning in to today's session, Mainstreaming Biodiversity Within Agriculture, part of the 2021 Ontario Biodiversity Summer Summit. And thanks for bearing, through, bearing with us through some technical difficulties throughout the presentation. Your patience is greatly appreciated. Stay tuned for another session later, uh, starting at 1 p.m., uh, entitled Mainstreaming Biodiversity Within Forestry. If you haven't signed up already, it's not too late. Uh, head over to the Ontario Biodiversity Council's website, ontariobiodiversity.ca, to register.
all sessions are free, so you have no excuse. And while you're there, have a look at some of the additional sessions coming up later in the month as part of the 2021 summit. On September 23rd, we have a session on maintaining biodiversity within business. And in October, funding biodiversity and nature-based climate actions, investing in natural infrastructure for biodiversity and climate resilient communities. And lastly, our closing session. Again, all the information and registration can be found online. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed today's session and learned as much as I did. Thank you again, and we'll see you later this afternoon.